Hi, and welcome. This is the Elemental series. It's an online speaker series of dialogues that's hosted by the Desert Humanities Initiative. It's at the Institute for Humanities Research at Arizona State University. The uh, elemental is something fundamental, it's grounding. However, things that are fundamental sometimes seem intangible. So for example, touching uh, igneous rock in the elven chasm of the Grand Canyon can feel like touching something fundamental, literally grounding, the exposed rock from a distant past. Yet thinking about the age of this rock, some 1.8 billion years, is rather abstract. And the elemental moves between this abstraction of something fundamental and its concreteness. And this to me is one way of thinking about the time and space of the desert. Time is both abstract, especially long durations, and uh, beyond human scale. And yet it's something concrete, something we can experience, see, touch, live in. So this paradox of the elemental is replete in the desert. And this series of conversations will allow us to explore such elemental paradoxes, whether it's extraction, for example, elements such as copper, uranium, rhenium are extracted from the desert to be used far away in complex human processes from wiring to nuclear weapons to jet engines or borders that are elemental. They define a region such as the US-Mexico border. They're both abstract lines and laws and concrete things, a wall or nice policing action or the lived experience of migrants. In Elemental Eco-Criticism, the editors Jeffrey Cohen and Lowell Duckert bring together these paradoxes of concrete materials and abstract thinking. The collection of essays, Elemental Eco-Criticism, ranges from sea and fire, mud and earth, to elemental relations and elemental love, so necessary for living with an environmental mindfulness. Uh, it's my opportunity and pleasure to introduce the speakers. Jeffrey Cohen is Dean of Humanities at Arizona State University. He's widely published in the fields of medieval studies, monsters theory, posthumanism, and eco-criticism. His book, Stone, an, Eco an Ecology of the Inhuman, received the 2017 Rene Welk Prize for best book in comparative literature from the American Comparative Literature Association. In collaboration with ASU professor Lindy Elkins Tanton, he received co he recently co-wrote the book Earth: Reexamination of Earth from the perspective of a planetary scientist and a literary humanist. And he's currently co-writing a book on arcs and archives towards an ecological refuge. And Low uh, Ducker. Uh, specializes in early modern drama and travel literature, environmental criticism, new materialism, and water studies. He has published on various topics such as glaciers, polar bears, the color maroon, rain, fleece, mountaintop removal mining, and lagoons. In general, his work attempts to reshape present day relations between humans and non humans by plumbing pre modern wet worlds. His book, For All Waters, Finding Ourselves in Early Modern Wetscapes, was published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2017 and shortlisted for Society for Literature, Science, and Arts, Michelle Kendrick Memorial Award for the best academic book on literature, science, and the arts. And he's currently researching two projects on cryopolitics. The first investigates the strange vitality of ice, and the second, follows the compacted object of the snowball. Before we start, I'd like to say a special thanks to the people behind the scenes today. Joe Carter at Livestream Success, Selena Osuna, Assistant Director of Desert Humanities and Coordinator of the Institute of Humanities Research, and Lauren Whitby, the Institute's Senior Communications Specialist. 
Uh, you'll note that in this, this webinar, the chat is disabled and you can submit your questions in the Q&A function in Zoom or in YouTube. And please submit your questions anytime throughout the event to be addressed at the end. And now it's my pleasure to, uh, to hand this over to Jeffrey and Lowell. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Lowell, it's nice to be here with you. Hey, man. Yeah. <laughs> How are things in Delaware? Uh, uh, dark, dark and rainy, you know. Um, but uh, I think everyone's feeling pretty good. Pretty good in, in, uh, in Delaware right now. <laughs> Why would that be? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, we're feeling the holiday spirit. You know, we're, <laughs> we're getting close to, to Thanksgiving, and that's it. That's that's the, it. Well, I do it. note that you're wearing a blue shirt today. Oh, oh. Wow, that yes, and I'm coming to you from a blue Arizona as well. Okay, very nice. Yeah, so here's to better futures. Yes, there, here is to better futures. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. One of the things I was thinking about, Lowell, is that, I, first of all, I feel very fortunate that you know I've had a long collaboration, uh, actually the longest collaboration I've had with anyone. Usually people I collaborate with just give up at a certain point and storm away, but you've never done that, and I really appreciate it. it, it, it one of the things that I think, um, as I was going back and rereading elemental eco-criticism, one of the things that I liked about it and one of the reasons that I've enjoyed collaborating with you is that uh, there's a real sense of hope that's in it. And there's so much that's going on in the world, in the environment, uh, that would be reasons for despair. But I've really enjoyed doing projects built around hope with you. So I wanted to start by saying that. Yeah, well, I mean, likewise. I, mean, I think, it, especially right, the, the world we live in, the the, he, the heavy matters that we, we deal with, it, it's it's hard to find ways to move forward. But you know, collaborating with you has given me, and, and hopefully, the people we teach and the people we work with, um, have new avenues to to think through. Yeah, and actually, what, before we share our screen and start talking about what we're supposed to talk about. Um, those in the audience may not know this, but Lowell actually did his master's degree here at ASU, uh, transformative experience working with Ayanna Thompson, of all people, back when she was here. She launched him towards success and introduced Lowell to me when I was at George Washington University. And uh, this is coming to you from the IHR at Arizona State University. And one of the things that gives me hope and makes me very happy to be a dean here uh, is because I have the most amazing faculty that I work with. We, we have things like an Institute for Humanities Research, and we have faculty who are among many, many other interesting things that they do, really dedicated to the environmental humanities and building better worlds. So it's kind of nice to be able to welcome you home by including you in this conversation as well. Yeah, it is my it is my uh, my my first time. I guess back in back in Arizona, virtually, virtually. Yeah, since uh, since '07. Yeah. Um, quick, quick, quick shout out um, to you know to to Ayana and the ACMRS. Uh, if it wasn't for Pericles, I wouldn't be doing water right now. Right. That was that was given to me in my graduate Shakespeare class. Shakespeare wrote that. Taught by Ina Thompson. So, yeah. She's changed a lot of lives. <laughs> it's a good thing we brought her back to ASU. That's all I can say. She's one of, but one of many amazing colleagues here. All right, so we're gonna really start what we're supposed to do. I am gonna share my screen and I'm gonna apologize to everyone who's watching because inevitably when I try anything technical, it uh, self-destructs on me. Um, but hopefully, and somebody's going to tell me if this isn't true, everybody is now looking at three books on their computer. Lowell, do you see three books? Beautiful books. Yeah, they are beautiful books. So um, these three books are books that, uh, they're actually records of the collaboration that Lowell and I did together. Um, you'll see elemental eco-criticism is the middle one, uh, but just very briefly, prismatic ecology was trying to think beyond green in eco-studies and think of the world of color and its materiality. 
uh, Lowe wrote a really great piece in that one. Elemental Ecocriticism, the one that we'll talk about today, uh, was our attempt to talk about the materiality uh, of the environment, but using, um, using knowledge that had been forgotten, actually actively forgotten and uh, repressed. And then Vericology was the biggest collaborative undertaking that Lowell and I have ever undertaken. I think we had 33 contributors to that. Isn't that right, Lowell? 33? 3,300 was the, the official tally. 33 million. It was 30 I, I, million. I think it was 33, <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> but <laughs> the books are part of an ongoing conversation among many, many people. And you'll see each cover tends to pick up a piece of the previous cover. So they each contain each other in them. Well, do you want to talk about why we turn to the elements? Well, I mean, I actually, I was thinking about that question today and uh, I went back and I, I read our introduction to um, a special issue of Post Medieval that we did called Ecomaterialism. And while, while I was reading that, yeah, how? Uh, and when I was reading that, um, it, it brought to mind um, the, the experience that we had when we were in, in Barcelona in Spain, you were, you were, you know, giving a, a talk on monsters and, and I was just kind of like, you know, hanging out and, um, you know, having, having fun. Um, but I remember um, going to uh, Park Guell, I, I think, I hope I'm saying that right, um, in, in Barcelona and just, I mean, for those of you who don't know what, what it is, it, it's, it's, um, Imagine if you had this kind of like terrestrial park space, but you rendered it fluid. Um, so uh, the, what, what a stone uh, looks like, looks like waves, right? And it's kind of hard to tell the difference between sort of water and earth and everything is really like bright and kind of fiery. It's very technicolor, right? Things that you wouldn't normally associate with like being kind of vivid, or just like very, very bright, very vivid. And you know, I think it was, I think it was just something about being in that and that space and then and just being so in, in in inspired by the elemental kind of mixture and the aesthetic of that, that um, this project kind of came about like eco-materialism that then led into um, elemental and then that led in, you know, into, into beer. But, um, you know, I, I, I think too that the, um, I think, you know, you and I were also kind of looking for, if I should just say, like you and I were just kind of looking for a means to collaborate with each other too, because we were working on stone and I was working on water and, you know, we kind of, I don't know, like maybe we, we had been talking about this when we were walking around, but like sometimes like scholarly work can feel so isolated and like individualistic and you know I'm writing my book on water and so and so is writing their book on water and you're working on stone but I'm going to do this differently than so and so and we were just kind of fed up with that maybe yeah no I, I, I think you're exactly right I, I, I think back to because you were talking about um, some of the fountains and artworks that we saw so it was when you were talking about your work on water and its fluidity rapidity uh, permeability uh, you helped me to realize that really stone is slow water I and mean, they both flow they both penetrate it's just that they work at different tempos and i think one of the things that we came to realize is that thinking through the elements gives a humanly perceptible way into thinking through ecology i'll just go back to this for a second i remember one of the things that we wrote is a reason to think with the elements is that they're smaller than gods and larger than atoms meaning that the problem too much with uh, environmental causation is we either ascribe it to physics or the divine, something we can't really reach or apprehend, or to atoms or particles that are so small we can't experience them with our, our human senses and our human body. And one of the things that we came to realize is that 
one, one thing that the elements offer is a way to engage materiality that is at human scale, apprehensible, and therefore possibly can be deployed for environmental activism uh, because there's so much energy around them. Uh, here's the, uh, the little picture that helped to inspire what we did in the Ecomaterialism journal, uh, special issue of the journal, which really was our first attempt to think through the four elements. What we loved about this Amy Stein picture is that this coyote howling at a street lamp gets at a nature culture bifurcation. You can see the line goes right down the middle. That you look at it long enough and you realize that that coyote is not the work of nature so much of as taxidermy. There are no footprints around it. It's clearly been placed there. We really wanted to get at ways of um, making nature and culture thinkable together. Isn't, isn't that right, Lowell? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, you know, the, the elements sound so, I, well, I mean, it, the, the, the pun that we play with, like the elements sound so elementary, right? They're just simple. It's fire, earth, air, water, um, you know, water is wet, fire is hot, like, um, and, you know, there was a challenge there um, and a curiosity there to kind of say, well, you know, these elements are much more complicated and difficult, hard to understand, hard to grasp. Um, and one of the reasons why that we, we came to, to, to really kind of run with and to, to acknowledge is that they're, they're always in, 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 in mixture, right? So you know, if one of the hallmarks of eco-criticism and environmental humanities is, is kind of breaking down dichotomies between nature and culture, human and non-human, uh, you, know, you know, coyote and, and, and shopping center, right? We're trying to move away from those clean divides. The elements are, are, are are and were perfect for, for thinking about the kind of the, the, the messiness and the kind of the difficult Thank you, Liz. The inter interstices that the elements represent, right? They don't really work alone. They're working in conjunction with another element, with humans, with non-humans. And I mean, for us, we just kind of saw that as a, as a way to just kind of like dig, dig deeper, right? Mm -hmm. Rather Kind of be like, well, wait a minute. We got to like separate these things out, and we got to figure out like, here's what fire is, here's what water is. But we 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 took that as as an invitation, right? Which um, just seemed very kind of like real, right? <laughs> like the, like the, and to use that word, I mean, just the the, the messiness. Right? Dig deeper is a nice way to put it too, because the other thing that we both had in common is that we are both as environmental humanists, very much dedicated to addressing things like climate change and involved in activism around ecological issues, absolutely. But we don't make a divide or we don't make an artificial divide between work done in the present and thinking that's been done in the past. So you, for the most part, turn to an early modern archive uh, and find rich counter narratives to the kinds of stories that we tend to tell these days. My own archive tends to be medieval, classical, biblical. And I think one of the things that we came to realize is that there is a very long history in the West of thinking through elementality that if reactivated might give us a better way into environmental issues now. You know, one of the things that I remember you and I were looking at together, I think it was you that drew, drew this picture on the left to my attention. It's a J. Henry Fair picture of, um, I think it's the, the waste coming out of a paper mill being whirled through a pond in order to disperse it. And it's beautiful. Uh, it almost looks like neurons in a brain but it's terrifying too. Those are toxins being released into Louisiana and then you know, into, a, I think it's into a bayou and then into um, from there into the ocean. And we, it struck us that one of the ways that, that thinking the elements gives you as a way into thinking eco-materiality is that the elements can only move. That's just what they do. They're, they're propelled by two forces. One is the force of Nikos, which is strife. It makes them always at war with each other. The other is the force of philia, which is love, 
But if love triumphs, all love can do is bring things together so permanently that they suffocate and die. You need love and strife at once. And that's why the shape of the elements is always a vortex. They're always rising and falling and begin to spin. And we thought in that spin, especially in a year of superstorms, when we were writing this, uh, the introduction to this collection, hurricane after hurricane was hurling itself against the East Coast of the United States. And then at a key moment when we were writing the introduction together, the polar vortex came down from the Arctic and snowed us into DC. Uh, I think you, you, you missed a bus for a few days to get back to, you were living in West Virginia at the time. So thinking through why the vortex keeps forming, what way into uh, thinking origins and possibilities, the deadly, the lethal, you know, the, the racially unjust, you can't think of a hurricane without thinking of Katrina, environmental justice, the, the ways in which suffering in the wake of catastrophe is always unevenly distributed, but also too the more uh, creative, destructive at once possibilities, some of the, the, the beauty and the terror at once. Yeah, no, I, th I think that, yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, I, I, uh, I think we use the word a lot of, 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 you know, the vortex is a site of like potentiality, right? I mean, it's, it's, Right. I mean, if you have if you have to think of it in terms of love and strife in conjunction with one another, um, right? You're not headed into inevitable, right? Strife, right? Or inevitable harmony, right? I mean, the, both possibilities are present there at once. Um, so you know the elements and and um, you know what we were trying to accomplish in, in our in our in our work was trying to figure out well how do you like how do you cohabit this space and like, exactly like you said like um, who who is being world uh, more than uh, more than others like who's harm who's being harmed from this who's benefiting from this um, you know I also think of the periodic table of, of elements and I think of lead and I think of like um, Black, black bodies being poisoned by, by lead. Um, I think of uranium and I think of Native American bodies um, being, you know, penetrated by ur like uranium and radiation. And, um, so, I mean, all, all, the, all these things are, are, are there and are at play in that space. And you're constantly kind of asking that, that yeah, that question of just sort of like, well, what's at stake? Where is this going, right? Who's being harmed? Who's being benefited? And then how, how can you change that? How can you kind of, how can you alter that 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 part of the of the the spin or of the whirl, right? So it's never a way just to kind of be like, well, that's the way it is, right? Everything is just kind of a you know a whirl, and then you just got to kind of write it out. It's like, well, no, you can you can um, I think like you were saying at the beginning, like you can you can do do it better, right? Um, so. The interesting term that you came up with, Lowell, while we were writing, which is, and it was to try to get at or get against some people who, who hold that the only really valid way to do environmental work or environmental humanities is to look at the present and to have an activist bent. And I think both you and I have an activist bent, I don't worry about that. But in order to um, justify in some ways the turn to the past, I use the word, you use the word term reactivism. And it was partly an activism that uses materials from the past and brings them forward in order to open up possibilities in the present, it does that in a very activist way. But also to reactivate past materials and to show the ways in which they're still potent can still spur our imagination to think differently, um, to apprehend the world differently, or maybe even, as you just said, to tell better stories. Yeah, you know, and I gotta say that, that that came out of a conversation that I had with a, a reproductive rights organization in in West Virginia because uh, in early 2014, uh, like a chemical uh, spilled in, into the the Elk River in Charleston, and 300,000 people went without water, um, and people who did drink the water. Um, were afraid and rightfully that the the chemical um, disrupted their 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 endocrine system, reproductive system, um, 
And uh, West Virginia Free, which is the, this reproductive rights organization, um, put out a campaign uh, in, before the midterms that basically just had women, women, like wet women, um, with uh, the slogan, um, we are bodies of water, right? To draw attention to this fact that, right, the water and the human are never separate, right? They are kind of world t together. And in this case, you know, sickly so. And I, and I heard that and I had conversations with them and I said, you know, that's essentially kind of what I'm arguing with early modern texts um, that, you know, the, the authors, travel writers, dramatists who were um, pointing out that, that the, the division between the, the human and the environment is, is, is a, a, an illusion. Um, and so, you know, from that conversation really just kind of developed this, this yeah, that this idea and this kind of drive to kind of say like, you know, these things are not outdated or outmoded. These stories from the past are not outdated or outmoded, but they, they live on and they continue to do work, right? Um, good work. So. They do, and Lo, you bring me to, I'll, I'll share it in a second, our, our last picture that we're gonna show in a moment, but you remind me of a realization that we came to once the book was finished, which is that, you know, the book for the most part was written fully embedded within Western tradition, which is honestly the tradition in which both you and I were trained as part of our doctoral study. Um, we didn't, either of us, go to institutions where part of the training was to kind of look beyond certain set structures. And, you know, we both became adept philologists who could go into the archive and study things from classical tradition on the way up. But it leaves out a lot of the world. And I think that, you know, this is something that you and I as writers have come to realize is a, a real limitation in some of the earlier work that we did, including elemental ecocriticism and a lot of the work that, uh, that proceeds under the rubric of the environmental humanities. It's, you know, it's, it's too white, it's too Western. Um, another way of putting this is, you know, you talk about a uh, woman and water and bodies of water. You know, it's something that indigenous peoples from various places and spaces have been saying for a long time, but have not been adequately attended to. I'm just putting up here, um, the cover to the latest English language notes, Indigenous Futures and Medieval Past at Taryn Andrews and Tiffany Beaches, a phenomenal uh, piece. I, I wish that I had been able to think indigeneity and the medieval years and years ago, and I admit I'm too much of a late comer to it. Um, there are plenty, uh, there, the, yeah, I, I will simply say that I, one of the things that um, I've come to realize is that I looked for alternative stories by going deep, deep, deep into the archive of the West, but that knowledge was already held very close by. Um, really, so what Lo and I, in talking about this a couple of days ago, decided that we actually uh, feel like our entire book could be reduced to a poem that a poet both of us admire, and I'm going to show you, uh, hopefully, show it to you now. Um, a poet who is here at uh, Arizona State University is Natalie Diaz, and in collaboration with O'Hara Hale, uh, her poem Lake Loop has been turned into a work of art. And honestly, for anyone in the audience, I can tell you, you, you don't have to read Elemental Ecocriticism because here's a better version of the entire book. So we're gonna take four minutes and let you enjoy this. I'm Natalie Diaz. This is my poem, Lake Loop. Because there was yet no lake. Into many nights we made the lake, a labor and its necessary laborings to find the basin not yet open in my body, yet my body, any body, wet or water from the start, to fill a clay, start being what it ever means, a beginning, the earth's first hand on a vision quest wildering night skin fields for touch, like a dark horse made of air. 
turned downward in the dusk, opaquing, a hand resembles its ancestors, the war, or the horse who war made. What it means to be made, to be ruined before becoming, rift, glacial ablation and breaking, lake hip sloping, fluvial, then spilled. I unzip the lake, walk into what I am, the thermocline and oxygen. As is with kills, rivers, seas, the water is of our own naming. I am wet, we call it, because it is. A happening is happening now. Imagined light is light's imagination, a lake shape of it the obligatory body, its dark burning, reminding us back, memory as filter, desire as lagen, a hydrology. The lake is alone, we say in Mojave. Every story happens because someone's mouth, a nature dependent, life, universe, here at the lake, say, she wanted what she said to slip down into it, for which a good lake will rise. Lake, which once meant sacrifice, which once meant I am devoted. Here I am, atmosphere, sensation, pressure. The lake is beneath me, pleasure bounded, a slip space between touch and not. Slip of paper, slip of hand, slip body turning toward slip trouble. I am who slipped the moorings. I am so red with lack. To loop not, or leave the loop beyond the knot. We won't say love because it is. A difference between vertex and vertices. The number of surfaces we break. Enough or many to make the lake. Loosened from the rock. One body's dearth is another body's ache. Lay it to the earth. All great lakes are meant to take. Sediment, leg, wrist, wrist, the ear, let down and wet with stars. Dock lights, distant but wanted deep, to be held in the well of the eye, woven like water, through itself, in and inside, how to sate a depression if not with darkness. If darkness is not fingers brushing a body, shh, she said, I don't know what the world is. I slip for her, or anything, like language, new each time, diffusion, remade and organized, and because nothing is enough, waves, each an emotional museum of water. Left light trembles a lake figure on loop, a night loop. Every story is a story of water, before it is gold and alone, before it is black like a rat snake. I begin at the lake, clean once, now drained. I am murk, I am not clean. Everything has already happened. Always the lake is just up ahead in the poem. My mouth is the moon, I bring it down, lay it over the lake of her thighs, warm, lamping axe, hewing water's tender shell, slant slip, entering like light, surrounded, into another skin, where there was yet no lake, yet we made it, make it still, to drink and clean ourselves on. Yeah, I think, um, I think if there's gonna be elemental eco-criticism, the sequel, um, more elements, <laughs> that's the subtitle. Um, Natalie needs to needs to like be in the. Be in the I know everything has already happened. I, I I think I've read that poem three hundred times. It always sends a chill down my spine. Certain words in it, and then the animation captures it so perfectly. But you know, here we were doing a scholarly edited collection, gathering twelve contributors sweating to death over getting the introduction right and so forth and so forth and then a poem conveys so much more than that that book does and i think that's you know maybe that maybe one of the reasons why i'm so enamored of that 
collaboration where the poem gets visualized too, is that I feel like it puts into action a lot of what we were trying to theorize. And at least in a scholarly register um, or a scholarly prose register, I don't even want to say because that, that, that's as scholarly a poem as you could ever find, at least in a register that we could we were working in, uh, launch language into a place that it had not been previously. Yeah, I, I like. Yeah, I like that. I mean, the idea of launching something. I mean, that's just like that. That clip is so affective. Um, I mean, when I when you showed it to me a couple of days ago um, for the first time, I was just like jotting like phrases and words down, just like just like just down like down the page because each each one of these phrases like ruin before i'm looking at it now like ruin before becoming i mean that the, the idea of, of of the elements having to necessarily like to compose and decompose right and to, to become something else um her focus on beginnings like water is beginning um yet my body anybody water i mean it's just the and her i mean playfulness isn't the right word but her kind of her playfulness with phrases like slip and she's actually kind of showing you um how how words can accrue meanings and different meanings in real time which is what i think we're we were very much trying to do with just a word like water right <laughs> or fire right it's not just this what else can it be um, and as soon as you put that down, we want to put it out there in the world and let it, let it, let it go, right? And I, um, I, I mean, the, the last thing, I, I mean, I could talk about this forever, but the last thing I'd say about this is that I love how the, the clip itself is sort of like a loop, right? Because you can go back to it and watch it for four minutes. And every time you re-enter that space, you're not going to get the, the same experience. So you're going to get that kind of vertical, spirally moment where you're taking new meaning and then moving on right even when i rewatched it today it's just like yeah uh, so it's it's very meta in that in that sense like it, it pulls you in and and um and just like you said launches you launches you forward into something else yeah. and it, it it's interesting to me that you know one of the reasons why we were attracted to elemental theory which is you know and empedocles launches that into the world in greece uh, was because it aspired to try to loop things in ways that were infinitely combinative, regenerative. It had love, it had desire, it had queerness, it had the unexpected, it had things going wrong, it had things going right. There was nothing, nothing was foreordained about it. And I think that was one of the reasons why we like to think with it. It also came from a time you know, when Empedocles had to write in poetry because physics needed poetry in order to be expressed. You could not be, you could not write serious physics without poetry. And how did we lose that knowledge? Aristotle. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, I was gonna say, I mean, this partly because coming up tradition kept narrowing all these knowledges out. Yeah. yeah. One other thing I'll say, and I know that we've got to turn it over to Q&A. One other thing that I was struck by in the methodology that we tried to articulate as we were working with our collaborators and, and doing what we could to um, come up with something that was of all of us, was very often the methodology was simply to take words apart and to find in their etymology other possibilities that had been forgotten. So, so much of elemental eco-criticism breaks words up and shows how, even though we cemented the word into one thing, actually open it a little and a vortex of other possibilities are still swirling in there. It's language history. I think there was one point where we said something like, uh, etymology is the geology of language. And if you get it, the sedimentariness of it, you can make words do other things. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting too. Uh, I was, I was rereading it and we have a line in, in the, I think the, the intro to Elemental where we say something like what you were just saying. We're like, within the word environment is the word vero, which means to veer. And we just kind of move on. And then, you know, from that came the collection Beer Ecology, which is kind of built on that, that like you said, that, that, that movement in which, which 
words in the material world are intricately linked, right? And it's, if you go into one, you go into the other and you, and you build, right? Mm -hmm. um, so words are <laughs> such an effective, affective technology, but I think like all technologies, sometimes you have to break them so that they can start to become something else or build them into something else. Yeah. Okay, so I was told that we should stop oh, around now. <laughs> if Ron, if you want to come back in, if there are questions or not. Hey, yeah, thanks so much, guys. That was that was really really lovely, and I'm just struck by how that series of the the three the whole collection really was an opportunity to break open ego criticism an invitation to think in different ways um, to help the rest of us. So it became a generative exercise. I know I've taught uh, Vera Ecology in the past um, and uh, the students wanted to come up with their own words, right? And many people can think of their own elements that they want to contribute. And so it's a really uh, generative opportunity. So thanks for that. Sure. And Ron, it, it reminds me that one of the things that inspired us with Vericology was in Raymond Williams when he wrote um, keywords, he left blank pages at the end to make sure that people could write their own contributions. And we just thought the invitational writing is not something that we do enough as academics. We tend to do writing that closes down possibilities and tells people how it should be or how they should think or feel. But then there is this other mode uh, that I think you know, a, a lot of people have um, turned to more, especially more recently, but, you know, there's always been a longer history of it, of inviting people to inhabit other possibilities in a more affirmative way forward. And so that speaks to some degree to what you're talking about with poetry as well and poetics of thought, which is it provides us an opening an opening for thought to breathe a bit, for words to be sufficiently twisted and turned in different ways and reconsidered or reconfigured um, so that we can come to that poem again and again and we can return to those thoughts. Um, it's interesting, uh, one, of the uh, one of the fans of Stone, uh, Paul Harris, who as you know, uh, is editor of uh, Substance, or, uh, the journal, um, commented on uh, the talk that uh, that the journal substance is moving in this direction of uh, multimedia and work that's not art or criticism but both and in, in different at the same time and uh, in this direction with these issues it's a series of experimental theory it seems like things like elemental theory clearly want to play in these media uh, and they need to integrate into publishing and tenure counting and other ways of uh, sort of the way we count work. Um, Paul also invites uh, us, he says, well, we really need an academic dean on board. So <laughs> get in touch with Paul on that. People love to sign me up for things, I've noticed that. But yeah. I am on board, of course I'm on board. How, how can I not? <laughs> I think that, yeah, I, I do think one of the most brutal unthought structures that we still retain in place, mostly because senior faculty think that because some senior faculty think that because they went through it one way, it should continue to be that way, are promotion and tenure requirements. Um, they are not serving many of our junior faculty well, and yes, they certainly do have to be rethought. Yeah, thanks. We, there's another uh, question by um, one of the new faculty here at ASU, uh, who says, uh, Yuriko uh, Furuhata talks about Eastern philosophies of elementality, stone, wood, feng shui, et cetera, as architectural figures that organize space and produce pathways. And Eastern philosophy of elements also seem to think a lot about balance and homeostasis. And so uh, she's wondering uh, how these ideas might interact with Western discourse on the elements 
and how we might think of the tension between elemental excess and elemental containment. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's a really good question. I mean, Lola, I'll, I'll let you answer because I've been talking like crazy, but I will say just very, very briefly that, you know, there's, there's lots of work that's been done, for example, on stone in Japan, in China, scholar stones, Zen stones, you name it. And some of it uh, seems to me filled with possibility. Uh, some of it seems really orientalizing because it's from people that imagine that it's, you know, well, that's what oriental, it, it's a work of imagination rather a work of actual culture encounter. So I've not dug all that deeply there, but I, I do think there are possibilities for other ways but I think that's what we wanted to get at with Natalie's poem, right? There are other ways of thinking elementality. It's not that, uh, that challenge some of the um, assumptions that we've, we've long had. You don't have to go all the way to classical Greece to find that challenge. Right. No, that's, that's really, really helpful. And um, there's an, another sort of interestingly related question about the relationship. So if we think about this relationship between experimentality and uh, homeostasis and, and excess, uh, which is, uh, has writing about stone or water changed your relationship with these uh, elements or objects in your everyday lives? Um, well, can, can I can I can I go back to the, the one before? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Maybe I can maybe I can connect them because I, I was just thinking um, it's such a great question, um, uh, Lisa. Yeah, because I, I was thinking of the, the image that we had in the in the slides of the the, the four elements and the little like glasses. Um, I don't know if you I don't know if you remember that, but it's just a good way to think about that tension. Like on on, on the one hand. Um, you know, we, we, we do we do seek as humans, like we, we do seek order and we seek containment at times. Like we, we maybe we don't want to be part of a world, right? And get world and bewildered or poisoned or sickened. Um, so there is that dependent desire for con containment. Um, and there also has to be a kind of an acknowledgement of, of the, the elusive. Right. So even in those images that we had, like the, the elements are kind of within their little glasses, but they're coming out, right? So fire is out of the glass, the, the earth, the earth, uh, the shoot is coming out of the glass. Um, water is coming out of the glass, right? Um, and so I think I would kind of bring it back to that, that idea of just kind of, uh, of love and strife, right? It's the, it kind of fits into um, that, dy that, that dynamism. Sometimes they'll be in, sometimes they'll be out. Maybe they'll be out, uh, outside of our uh, set of our control. Um, and there's that kind of obligation to, to acknowledge that. Um, and then I was thinking like the, the first part of your, your, your question too, you know, it, it's funny, like when we, when we did elemental eco-criticism, we included um, uh, two elements that are just, that we wouldn't think of elements now. One is phlogiston which is the element of ignition. And then the other um, element is ether. Um, and, you know, we're still thinking through a, a Western kind of discourse, but I, th I think we're, we're, we're totally in line with what you're, what you're saying here is that we, we don't want to kind of monopolize a specific discourse, but, but like pluralize it and say, in these traditions, maybe there's five, maybe there's six, maybe there's seven, maybe there's more, right? Um, so you have all these different kind of um, discourses to, to choose from, but you're not in, you're not thinking like inherently. Well, one is is more authoritative than the other. So I would say like absolutely like it, it just needs to be more in the conversation. So um, I'm working on ice right now, and the the thing that just uh, blows my mind about about ice is I, I've been reading. Um, Sheila Watt Cloutier's work. She's an Inuit um, climate climate activist, and she'll say things like, yeah, "Ice is life," um, and I, I, is, is ice a, a different element than, than water in that case? Maybe, but she's she's thinking about elementality that doesn't just sort of compartmentalize, objectify, right? It's it's 
deeply enmeshed with her and is embedded in a specific tradition that then I can kind of pull from and that others can pull from. So I just, I, I love that question. Um, and then the, the, um, the, the second one, um, yeah, you know, I, I, at least for me, for water, I just, you know, um, going back to the story I was saying about West Virginia Free, the reproductive um, rights organization, um, when I first kind of came to this, um, I was almost kind of doing like environmental histor historical work. I was just sort of like, okay, where was ice in the 16th century? Where was water in the late the late 16th century? Where was where were swamps and where where were where was rain? Um, but the, yeah, the more I got into it, um, the more I interacted with people who were um, in my discipline and outside of the discipline. The more I became more aware of of environmental justice, um, and that just completely like reshaped how I thought water interacts with with bodies. It's not just like the human, but you have to always be very attentive to which human, what which community, and also the non-human, like which non-human is being affected and, and, and why. Um, and I don't think if I hadn't like, you know, dug into that more, um, I don't know if I, I would have really gotten to that to that place. So, so now it's like in almost everything that I do, even when I was just saying about the ice and Sheila Wa Cloud here, I kind of have to think like, well, you know, how are Inuit communities thinking about this? How are Inupiat communities thinking about this? Um, and um, how can it kind of, how can it challenge, but also kind of expand my, my thinking on this. But um, that was definitely a shift that I just, I, I recognized um, just when I really started thinking about water more closely as a, as a, as a material uh, form. But I don't know about you, Jeffrey. Yeah, I mean, I, y yes, I, it, it's hard to, take something so seriously that it becomes a part of your life or even maybe better yet, what writing a book on stone made me realize is that stone has always been a part of my life. It's funny, I'm just glancing over on my shelf, I have this little stone, it's a little beach stone, it's about palm sized. Ever since I was a little kid, whenever I walk the beach in Maine, typically a gun quit, I would just scoop these things up. I couldn't, I couldn't resist it. And I think, and put them in my pocket and keep them and, and not really know why. I think, I don't know, they remind me of eggs. They remind me of futurity. They remind me of opening, openings up to the future in the way that rocks aren't supposed to. And then I noticed that my kids were doing the same thing. Whenever I took them to the beach, the pockets would be filled with rocks. I, I really became interested in what is, what is in stone that pulls the human towards it thought a lot about how we know the earliest human stories from, first of all, fossilized bone, right? Bone made rock, but bone actually is rock, it's calcium. But also through, through things like um, little fire shields that uh, ancient humans put up and rocks that could simultaneously be first tools for doing things like scraping, but first weapons, you hurl a rock and you can kill at a distance. You suddenly exert the human into the environment in a way that is deadly, potentially. So I became really fascinated by how rock is a technology that enables the amplification of the human, allows all kinds of things to happen, but also became enamored of the question of, well, what does that do for stone? And is it in some ways, a, is there a kind of partnership? Has stone colonized our very body in order to give us skeletons that enable mobility? It's, I, I, I suppose ultimately what I learned to ask were questions of longer duration than human culture can answer. So whereas in, element, in elemental eco-criticism, we found ourselves going back to ancient Greece, a story of stone is gonna bring you back to uh, pre-human ancestors. And I like thinking about those things. I, I, I like the way it just opens up the world. Um, yeah. And the one other thing I'll say about it is I, one of the things I've really enjoyed being about at this point in my career is that my world gets opened up all the time by all the people I meet with their projects that they're working on. And 
uh, possibility keeps expanding. And I think that's, you know, that is the best way to, there's so much that's going wrong in the world right now, but so many brilliant artists, scholars, makers, you name it, um, the world is filled with possibility. We just need to listen to those who are amplifying possibility in a humane way. Long answer to that question, but Stone will always make you unravel a long answer. Thank you for that. No, thank you both. I like how you've really opened up Elemental to its relational ele relational capacities, uh, the necessity of that. So it's not just an extractive objects kind of thing. Um, one uh, final question then uh, before we wrap up, uh, which is, um, uh, again, goes back to questions of form and invited by the poem uh, that you read uh, or that Natalie read. Uh, I'll ask a question about uh, form or maybe it's about style. What do you think is the relationship between the formal movements of poetry, as in uh, the great poem you all shared, and the more constrained and footnote filled styles of critical essays? And what's the value, as I think, think all of your collaborations do, of pushing against the boundaries of critical essays, perhaps with the help uh, from poets. Feels like the answer's in that question, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can identify who asked that, but it's gotta be Steve Menz. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say that because he so beautifully does that in his own scholarship. Um, it's impossible to tell form from content sometimes. And I, I find it very inspirational the way in which his critical essays are always becoming poems. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I would just say it probably also goes back to the earlier conversation about what forms count toward promotion and tenure? What forms count professionally? What, like how, yes, I, I get it. We need to make things evaluatable. Wait, evaluate. Some word involving, some amazing adjective involving being able to be evaluated. That's what we need to make those things. But on the other hand, that kind of constraint is deadly to the human imagination. And there's got to be ways of opening up worlds instead of restricting them to these infinitely replicating familiar forms. We need those, but we need other things too. Yeah, I was, I was, I was gonna say that um, there's a reason why um, Steve's in many of our collections, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, I, I always just like, I, I, I think of like, um, like rhythm, like etymologically, like rhythm means flow. And there's just, I just love how you, you think of the fluidity of water and you think of the flow of words. And, um, but, you know, I also just love like the, what, what we did in our, in Elemental and in, and in Veer, and, and I think in, in Post Medieval too, is we, we really just kind of let people um, go with their, their word or their elements. And, you know, it, and we were very deliberate with experimentation. We were like, don't, I think like Jeffrey was saying, it's like, don't give us the, the you know, 100 footnotes, perfect an analysis of fire, right? And we, we want you to be kind of swept away and carried away and um, even like disoriented. And, um, you know, so absolutely, like we, we need more forums like that where experimental work is encouraged and, and, and valued um, because, you know, I, I think it's just like intensely enjoyable too. Like I, I never thought I would write about mountain top removal mining and Milton until I was sort of like, earth, what is this thing? And I'm surrounded by it, coal, right? Like, well, what is coal? And then you just, you kind of go down that route, right? Well, when you put it that way, it also reminds me too why another one of our frequent collaborators has been the art historian, Ann Harris. I love how when Ann Harris has been close looking at something and then unfolding this sentence that is so emotionally loaded that by the time you're at the end of it, you're like, <gasps> and always her next word is just, oh, O-H, period. Like she lets you exhale and then she'll go on because she had to exhale at that moment. And there's something that's so, to find that in scholarly writing, 
to, you know, that, that kind of intensification of passion and emotion without losing sight of, it's not, it's not just about celebrating things, right? It's not losing sight of the fact that to go back to the figure of the vortex, the vortex is a hurricane and a hurricane is a figure for among other things, racial injustice, environmental racism, you name it, like all those things have to be thought together. Um, but it's, it's the, the, it's the both and I think that, that really can work when, when it comes to articulating a style as well as articulating a focus, articulating an ambition. And um, yeah, I, I, I think in the collaborative work that we've done, we've been most drawn to writers and thinkers and artists who just want to go out and see how far something can take them without losing sight of an ethical grounding at the same time. It's not, you know, a flight of fancy for this for the sake of a flight of fancy. It's possible world making for in the hope that others are going to catch up and become residents of this more humane vision of how the world might be. No, yeah, thank you for that, both of you. And it's um it reminds me that uh, the Institute for Humanities Research has often thought of doing a panel just on style, the relationship between style and thought. And so this is spurring that on. So you might try to do that uh, within either spring or next year. So thanks. And I also want to thank both of you for this incredibly uh, generative series of books and this conversation. Um, you know, it's really great to be able to look back on that work and see this continues to be generative, fruitful, you know, uh, opens up a lot. Um, and then uh, to the viewers, I just want to remind you all of our uh, other events uh, in this series, and I've put the link in chat, but um, on Tuesday, November 17th, uh, Jada Och, who's a uh, faculty at ASU uh, will be talking about her recent book this out, uh, Sand, Water, Salt. And then on November 24th, uh, Marsha uh, Bjornarud, who's uh, the author of Time Timefulness, uh, a meditation on geology and time, uh, and interacting with geology and time, will be in conversation with uh, ASU's creator, uh, director of creative writing, Matt Bell. And then if you also look in the rest of the series of IHR events, um, we have uh, a few other really uh, compelling uh, uh, things going on. Uh, C. Pam Zhang is in, a, whose uh, recent book was um, shortlisted for the uh, Booker Prize. Uh, we'll be talking about her, her novel, How Much These Hills uh, um, Are Gold, which is, um, also uh, related to the desert and migration. And she'll be talking with uh, ASU's Jillian Lim, who's written about migration in the Southwest. Um, and tomorrow, uh, uh, Digital Humanities has a virtual uh, hour with uh, Spencer DC Krillis on uh, queer zines. So just a few of the things we have going on. And uh, again, thank you all. Really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Ron, and thanks to the IHR. Thank you, Lowell. Oh, well, thanks everybody. And I, you know, best best homecoming, I think. You know, back, we'll be back at ASU, even if briefly. <laughs> yeah. The next time we'll all be at Four Seasons Total Landscaping, however. Perfect. We welcome you. <laughs> <laughs>